Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Karen Krieger, Executive Director of the Salt Lake City Arts Council. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the final session of the 2015 National Arts Marketing Project Conference. On behalf of the Salt Lake City Corporation, the board and staff of the Salt Lake City Arts Council and 12 amazing arts professionals from Salt Lake City who came together to be your host committee. I can't tell you how honored we've been to have you all in Salt Lake City these last four days. Thank you so much for being here. And what an amazing four days it's been, right? Yeah, absolutely. We've learned how gut churn and being in the deep, dark German forests are those places of horrible angst and pain are actually important processes in the artistic process and how they take us to greater levels. We've been challenged to be um, um, uh, cultural warriors, right? <laughs> and to diversify our leadership and to really lead from our passion. And I'm so excited to catch a few more kernels of inspiration this morning to really take our lift off that, those things that we've learned this weekend to even greater heights. Please don't forget to continue sharing your successes and your challenges with each other with this really amazing close-knit group of people that we've created this weekend. This session, like all of the, the keynote sessions, is being webcast live. And there'll be an opportunity to ask questions both from all of us here and those of our colleagues um, at home watching this session. Now, I'm really, really delighted to introduce um, this morning's keynote speaker. Beth Cantor is an established international leader in nonprofits use of social media. She is the author of Beth's blog, one of the longest running and most popular blogs for nonprofits. She's also the author of The Network Nonprofit and Measuring the Network Nonprofit, awarded the Terry McAdam Nonprofit Book Award for 2013. She was named by Fast Company as one of the most influential women in technology in one of Business Week's Voices of Innovation for Social Media. Beth will demonstrate how arts marketers can improve their organization's social media practice through embracing the best practices of networking, measurement, and learning from data while avoiding pitfalls and challenges. Beth will explore how to balance the art and science of using measurement and data, and how to create a culture of curiosity, creativity, and learning that yields better results. Please help me welcome Beth Cantor. How is everyone this morning after the karaoke last night? Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, you know, I want to thank you for that great introduction, and I am so happy to be here because I feel like, you know, I've been given a gift to hang out for a couple days with arts people, and, you know, this is where I started. So it feels like a homecoming in a certain way. So I'm going to start with um, my own little liftoff story. So. Um, that was me, and I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, but my dream was to be a uh, principal flutist in a major symphony orchestra, okay? That was my dream. And it became clear as I was going through music school that that, that dream was not going to happen, okay? Um, so I thought, well, if I can't have a career on the stage, maybe I can have a career behind the stage and still feel connected to the arts, okay? And in those days, there weren't any arts administration programs that you could go to, so I was in Philadelphia where I was in music school, and I knocked on the door of the general manager of the Philadelphia Orchestra, uh, Cy Rosen, and I said, Mr. Rosen, I want to be an orchestra manager. What do I need to learn how to do? And he said, have an iron cast stomach and learn how to type, honey. <laughs> okay, so it was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 so I got a manual typewriter. I, I, you couldn't get electric typewriter. And I got my metronome, remember I'm a music student, and I set it at Adagio, and I practiced typing until I could get to Presto and type 160 words per minute accurately. And I got my first job at the Boston Symphony Development Office. 
and I, um, I learned everything in development, and I moved to the box office. It was sort of my uh, arts administration degree in the streets. You know, I was learning as I was going. And then I decided I wanted to be a general manager of an orchestra, and I managed a small chamber orchestra called the Pro Arte Chamber Orchestra. I did some work with the, the Arts Council in the state, the Massachusetts Arts Council, worked a little bit as an evaluator uh, for the NEA. And in about 1990, I discovered the internet. I didn't invent it, I'll leave that to Al Gore, but um, I was really privileged um, to have a front row seat at the creation of a field. How nonprofits could use the internet to serve their missions. Very exciting, and I was working with a project um, at the New York Foundation for the Arts. I applied for a job for their ArtsWire network, which was an online network of artists and arts organizations, and we were doing online collaboration before we even called it online collaboration. And, um, and they hired me, even though I said at the interview, um, I don't know a modem from a microwave, but what I do know how to do is I know how to learn and I know how to share what I'm learning. And that's been my passion. Um, is that clicking? Yes, that's been my passion. It's not a career, it's been a calling. And it's taken me literally around the world. I've worked with thousands of nonprofits and social change activists on every continent of the world except for Antarctica. I'm not sure there's nonprofits there. So, um, so I spent a few years, um, a few years ago, I was invited to be visiting scholar at the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, and that's where I wrote the two books. Um, and the second book, um, won, as mentioned, won the Terry McAdams Nonprofit Book Award, and I thought, oh wow, this is gonna be my legacy. This is the, the, you know, the, high, the highest point of liftoff of my career, of my calling. I never thought in a million years that Conan O'Brien would be talking about me on his program and about social media. So let's, let's play the clip. I have a lot of followers. I have followers on Twitter, Facebook, Google Plus, and YouTube, uh -huh. okay? But there's one piece missing from my social media empire. I'm talking about LinkedIn, okay? <laughs> now, I'll be honest with you. I don't know what LinkedIn is. Yeah, I don't either. I have no idea. I asked around. It has something to do with business, right. I think, okay? But when I found out that I didn't have a presence on LinkedIn, I was outraged. I was freaked out. Mm -hmm. I want to rule LinkedIn. <laughs> I want to be the king of LinkedIn, even if I don't know what it all is about. Right. You don't have to know in order to rule it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So what I did is I created a LinkedIn profile. Okay? There I am, I'm dressed to go clubbing in Germany. All ready to go. And then I noticed that other people on LinkedIn, other business leaders, they post pictures of themselves sometimes with a world leader to sort of up their ante, make themselves seem more important. Uh -huh. For example, the founder of Craigslist, Craig Newmark, posted a profile photo of himself with President Obama. Okay? Big deal. Here's what I did. I put up something even better. This is a picture of me with former presidents Bill Clinton, George Bush, and Teddy Roosevelt. And check this out, we're all standing in the palm of Pope Francis. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, true story, kids. So far, I've amassed over 75,000 followers and I've now been deemed something, this is real, called a LinkedIn influencer. That's right. Just the other day I passed, I passed GE Chairman Jeff Immelt. He was my old boss at NBC. <laughs> so. <laughs> he's a good guy. Yeah. No problem with him. It's nice to pass him though. So we're on our way to the top but I deserve more followers and I will have them, I will. Look at some of the people with more followers than I, okay? Check it out, this guy, David Evans, has almost 80,000 followers. He calls himself Cisco's chief futurist. I'm sorry, I thought my job was bullshit. What the <laughs> hell, what's a futurist? I don't know. Do you know what a futurist I is? I know, I... Yeah, I'm a futurist. <laughs> no. Do you know the future? No. <laughs> Yeah, and when there's this woman, Beth Cantor, she has over 125,000 followers. That's right, she's wearing a hat she borrowed from macho man Randy Savage. And she has more followers than I do. It's absurd. Well, guess what? 
Me and the presidents can wear gaudy red hats too. There we are. <laughs> now we're talking. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, okay, so I gave Conant some advice, you know. It's not about the red hat, you know? It's not about the red hat. It's not about the number of followers you have on social media channels. It's about being socially present as your personal brand, building relationships with your stakeholders and your audiences, engaging them, and inspiring them to take action, whatever that action is. And um, Conan ignored me, and I uh, still have more followers than he does, okay? <laughs> Okay, so how and why is this possible that someone like me, just an individual, can have more influence than a talk show host, okay? Well, I probably don't need to tell everybody in this room about the three digital revolutions that are taking place over the last decade. All of you are marketers. You've, you probably know the Pew numbers by heart. Um, I can make a quiz here. Um, we know that 82% of Americans have broadband access at work, fast internet access. Not internet access like 15 years ago when it was like watching paint dry, remember that? Um, mobile phones, we're now up to 89% of Americans using mobile phones and they use it to connect to the internet, to conduct their lives anywhere, anytime, any place. And of course we have social networks, 72% um, of Americans use at least one network, what is that? And we know that between 23 and about 34% of Americans use at least two or more social networks. Okay, social networks with a combination of mobile and broadband are, have become like air. I said that five years ago and, and the audience went, oh, but you're nodding your heads, right? So we have these three digital revolutions that have been disruptive technologies, okay? You're supposed to laugh, I worked so hard on that to Photoshop <laughs> that, okay? Because <laughs> I was thinking, okay, I gotta find an arts image, and then they were holding apples, and then it led to, okay, what if they had iPhones in their, their hands, anyway. <laughs> but, you know, I don't need to tell you that it's been disruptive. All you have to do is, you know, look out into the rows of your theater, okay, if you permit it. Um, look around your dinner table, okay? or Look out the window, okay? You know, do you know that since 2010 that there's been a 35% increase in pedestrian accent, accidents? Because people are texting while they're walking and they bump into trees, they fall off the curve, they smash into cars, they are um, sustaining serious industries and in, in, um, injuries and even death. Okay, so it's, technology's just not all a black thing, okay? There's some hope. We have a generation that's growing up now, Gen Z, Gen Tech, um, Gen Generous, as they've been dubbed, who don't know what it's like not to be connected, not to have a portable device in their hands. They know how to wipe and swipe, <laughs> okay? And this, and this crowd, I'm glad you laughed at that too. <laughs> Here's another one, I'm gonna see if this resonates as well. They have been building social capital in the womb, all right? Hi, I'd like to add you to my professional network on LinkedIn, okay? That was from a New Yorker recaptioning contest and that one won. So, you know, so we have this revolution and it's making um, it possible for stories like this and it's impacting the way nonprofits, you know, can do fundraising, for example. So I'm gonna tell a story now. Um, it doesn't involve an arts organization, but it does involve arts materials, pens, okay? So this guy, his name is Gizor. He's from Finland. He's you know an activist, a human rights activist. Uh, he runs a online little magazine. It's just him. Like he's the equivalent of a small arts organization maybe, and he's covering human rights abuses in conflict zones. And of course, if any of you have been following over the summer what was happening in Syria, with the Syria refugee crisis, um, he tweeted this photo of a man with his daughter over his shoulder, selling pens, trying to, you know, make a living, to make it, okay? So he got a response from his followers asking, you know, um, who is this guy? We want to help him. Where can you find him? And so there was a lot of um, networking um, with people uh, that are following him and the people that are following them, and they found him. 
um, they got his WhatsApp number and they were able to contact him. In the meantime, there's this groundswell of pe people from his small Twitter following saying, we want to help this guy. We want to do a crowdfunding campaign. Come on, let's do this. And he said, no, we, we got to find a nonprofit. And luckily, in his network was a woman named Carol Malouf, who was the executive director of a, uh, a refugee support organization called uh, Lebanon for Refugees. So, uh, so they uh, put together a Indiegogo campaign, and they thought, let's raise, you know, we, maybe we can raise $5,000, get this guy a new life. His name was Abdul, his, his daughter was named Rem. And within a half hour, they raised $5,000, okay? And it got noticed by uh, mainstream media, picked up in the region, and within a week, they had raised almost $200,000. Now, of course, it wasn't for, uh, just for Abdul and his daughter Reem. Um, Carol Malouf, the, uh, who is the executive director of the organization, uh, had pulled together then a refugee support fund, and they were able to help many, many more refugees. And you can see her, um, her profile there and showing that's the daughter and the son um, on their way to school in Lebanon. So, you know, this is the power of this revolution, that it's, it's connectivity, it's allowing us to connect with people, and maybe we're not even driving it as the organization, you know, but it, it can benefit us if we're able to become network nonprofits. So in my first uh, book, and apologies for if some of you have seen my little chart. <laughs> so this is the way traditional nonprofits work, okay? It's changing. So we have staff behind the firewall, you know, in their cubicles. We have the institution. It's not very porous. And then it's trying to reach in isolation to solve a social change goal or its mission or to bring art <laughs> into the world. And that needs to change. It needs to become more networked and change from the inside out. So what do we have here? We have individuals on staff working in cross-disciplinary teams. They're also reaching out to their professional networks as their personal brands. The institution is becoming more porous, more transparent, allowing those insiders to get out and reach other networks of people and institutions and collectively move towards impact or achieving some goal together. Okay, so what does it take? You know, what are the skills and mindsets that are needed to work in this way and to begin to shift and work in this way? And so I've called this um, networked leadership. You know, some are mindsets, some are skill sets. And I'm, I'm going I'm to call out two of these um, uh, and, and, and tell some stories about it. But it's really about listening, engaging, and cultivating both organizational as well as your professional networks to achieve impact. Um, there's a new skill, I think a 21st century work skill, is reputation management and boundary management, and I'll explain why in a moment. Building trust, transparency, and really being authentic with audiences so you can inspire them. A new thing that I'm really, that I've been on the uh, on my soapbox for a while is transdisciplinary learning. Okay, we're all, we all come from the same lens. We all come from the same experience in the arts. But you can learn from adjacent practices and it's becoming more and more important to do that. Also being data informed and learning from failure and I'm gonna touch on that in the presentation. And a new area that's developing for me is this whole idea of, of having a culture of creative replenishment inside of your organization. So let's look at um, the network leadership and how you engage both from a brand perspective and a personal brand perspective. So the first thing I'm going to say is that your brand presence is not enough. And you're supposed to groan, <laughs> okay, <'Cause, clears throat> and throw tomatoes at me, but because I know um, if you're like most marketers, you're not just doing social media, and there's a lot of social platforms to be on, and you know, we're, we have a lot of work to do and not enough resources to do it. But your brand presence is not enough. Yes, you need a brand presence. And this example comes from Save the Children. They have over a million followers, and it's really they're focused on engaging with their supporters, donors, grassroots advocates, people who are really interested in ch uh, child welfare around the world. But their whole staff, including their executive director, are evangelists for their cause, okay? So uh, we have Carol Miles, 
And th this is her personal brand. It's aligned with what the brand does, but it's her voice. It's her authentic voice. And the audience she's trying to reach are influencers, journalists, policymakers, and world leaders. And she's having leadership discussions with people that are in the field doing work for Save the Children, being very transparent about it, very conversational, giving big donors a shout out uh, on Twitter. Now you might say, why, why bother with this? And the reason, you know, isn't the brand just reaching anybody, everybody that's interested? Well, if you look at some stats, you'll see <clears throat> Carolyn Miles, who has 22,000 followers, that pink circle is her reach. And the brand, which has a million followers, has that green circle as its reach on Twitter. And so you see some overlap. And um, other research says that 14% of a CEO's um, social media profile will overlap with the brand, but it'll reach uh, you know, a different audience. So there's, um, the reason that she has much greater reach is that she has more influential people who have um, a higher number of followers following her versus the brand, okay? So, so you can the benefit of, you have the benefit of reach. There's also capacity. When you empower and train staff to be your evangelists on social and even offline, it increases your capacity as a marketer, okay? You have to get buy-in to be get buy-in, buy -in, but then that gives you some headspace to think about strategy, okay? Gets you out of the weeds a bit. And then, of course, research showing from the Edelman Trust Barometer, people trust people more than brands. Okay, so it's a way of gaining trust. If you can gain trust, engage, then you can inspire action. So given these benefits, why is it that, you know, why aren't more arts brands leveraging personal brands of all their insiders in service of the art? You know, why are we running away from it? And I know that some of you are doing this, but I'm just asking a rhetorical, rhetorical question. So it comes down to this whole idea around boundary management. You know, in the olden days, and I remember them, you know, we had clear boundaries before the internet. Okay, before the internet came along, I could put my personal life in a box, I could put my professional life in a box, and my private life in a box, and my public life in a box, and there was no crossover, okay? And I was really pretty protected, it was easy. And then, you know, social media and the internet came along and there were blurred, okay? And you know, that's not gonna go away. As much as we don't like it, it's not gonna go away and that's the reality. So we, our 21st century skills for all nonprofits are to learn um, identity management, reputation management, and learn how to uh, dance between those boundaries effectively, okay? So there's three ways that you can think about this. Okay, this is what I tell CEOs of foundations and, non and, and nonprofits. There's three ways you can go about thinking about this, okay? You can be a turtle, okay? And go like this. Oh, that was loud. And hide, you know? Like, you know, don't have a presence online or, um, or only connect with family and friends. Don't connect it with your, um, with your work. You can be a jellyfish, you know, that's being all open. Let's let it all hang out online. You know, don't do any curation of your connections or what you're saying. And that could be problematical because people can see your social feed and develop an opinion about you and you won't have that interaction or feedback, okay? And it could reflect on your organization. Or you can be a chameleon, okay? And what do chameleons do? They change based on context. And the way that you can do that is to also develop a personal brand strategy that aligns with your organization, that you know, sets out a purpose, whether it's, a, it's a, you know, a marketing purpose, is it a professional development purpose, what is the specific audience you're going to reach, and what is your persona and tone. And this is where you can get increased trust and impact. So who wants to be a chameleon? Okay. I, Good. <laughs> okay. All right. So I actually found a fabulous chameleon in the arts. Okay. Can anyone guess who it is? <clears throat> no. Okay. Well, I'll. Sh oh, good. Well, um, I'll share this then. Okay. So I looked at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, I don't know if you know Shri at Shri, who's amazing. You should definitely follow him on Twitter. Um, you know, the Metropolitan Museum has, you know, its goal is to give people the best experience before they enter the, uh, the museum, 
while they're in the museum and then to continue to engage with them after they've um, come to the museum so they talk about it with their friends, okay? So uh, the, the staff, almost everyone on staff has a social profile and you can actually go up uh, um, and you can actually see a Google document that's open and you can see all the uh, social profiles of their staff. But Thomas P. P. Campbell, who is the CEO, um, has a presence that I, does a fantastic job of being a chameleon. And his purpose is donor engagement. He has thought leadership discussions with his peers. He's trying to reach donors, professional colleagues. He, his tone and persona, and it's authentically him, you know, he's not ghost tweeting or ghost Instagramming. It's professional, it's insider, his tone is funny, he's visual. I mean, he does come from a visual art institution. So what he's doing is really sharing the world through his iPhone, all in service of the art. And so of course he's sharing photos from his institution, but maybe he goes to a professional conference, he visits the local museum, he'll, he'll share some photos and discussion about that. He will give an inside view of what it's like to be leading the museum. You know, this is a, a photograph of um, one of their benefits um, setting up. But he's not just, a, you know, a, a going into the uncanny valley and being sort of a robot, and his narrative is not constructed by the PR people. It's actually him doing it. So he does add a little humor. Um, you know, this is his dog, Boswell, um, before the big benefit at the Met and then after. So he could go to the costume ball, but the, unfortunately the tickets have been sold out. So, and also he is human, okay? That's wishing his son happy birthday. So, so it comes down to this leadership um, on social through networks, having an authentic personal brand that aligns with the organization and doing this for everybody on staff, being human. So. I'm going to now shift over to talking about some human skills around using data, okay? Um, a lot of this is in my second book. And I want to talk to you for a moment and get really excited about using data for better decisions that leads to impact. I mean, I, I never thought in a million years I'd get excited about data, okay? But let me tell you a, a personal story about why I'm so excited about using data for better decisions that leads to more impact. So about a year and a half ago, I went to my doctor for my annual checkup, and I got my cholesterol taken, and whoa, it came back at 399. So if any of you know your numbers, you know, that, that pretty much sucks, right? <laughs> and, and she was about to write a script for Stanton's, and, and then, but she said, well, you, what you have to do for six months is, um, you know, to get into that healthy level, you know, you need to be doing some more exercise, you know, you need to follow something before we give you the, the drugs. So, of course, you know, I reflected, I've been doing a little bit too much of that, you know, and a little bit too much of that, you know, and I was completely ignoring the data on my dashboard, okay? Completely ignoring it. You know, I saw it, but I wasn't changing my behavior. I wasn't making decisions based on that. And as a matter of fact, I probably was using the wrong data point and I wasn't measuring often enough. You know, I needed more real-time data to guide some decision making. So I got a Fitbit, one of these, because what gets monitored gets measured and what gets measured, you have some data to make some changes. So I got a better dashboard. Um, I was able to start increasing my steps um, over time, I started with a small goal, made incremental steps. The social component, I got to race against my nonprofit colleagues, and of course, being competitive, I had to win. So that prompted me to walk more. And before I knew it, I was walking, you know, 15 to 25,000 steps a day. Went back to the doctor and got my cholesterol down to 99. Okay, the power, <laughs> the power of using data to make better decisions that leads. To better impact, okay? So what do you need as a nonprofit? What is that skill set that you need, okay? And I think you need a balance of, of skills. It's a yin-yang. You need the technical skills and you need some human skills. You know, what's between the dashboard and the chair, okay? That's a, a lot of that is very important, okay? So the, um, the, the technical skills, and, and there's a, you know, we go to this first, you know, how, you know, what are the survey questions? What's the quantitative information? How do I, you know, get statistics? How do I get, you know, all this information in the spreadsheet and how do I work with it? 
Um, and, and maybe we can identify objectives too, and maybe some transformational metrics. And, and those are super important to have, but you have to balance it with the human skills. Um, sense making, transformative metrics, um, agile decision making, qualitative research, sense making, and learning. They need to be in perfect balance with each other. Now let's look at what happens when you're not in balance. And um, I, I, I decided to protect the various nonprofits <laughs> that this resembles, but and we and there it's the stories are depicted in a, um, a set of two cartoons. So the first is you need a dashboard application to track your metrics. Okay. That way, you'll have more data to ignore when you make your decisions based on office politics, okay? <laughs> and you know what's coming is, will the data be accurate? Okay, let's pretend that that matters. <laughs> okay, you know, we have the hippo, the highest paid person in the organization or something, comes up with an idea, and then you're having to back it up. Or, or you have done some research, some data research, and you want to go in a particular direction, but a decision is made because of, of politics. That has to stop. Then there's this other situation that happens, and that happens when the, uh, you're examining your, your dashboard or reports, maybe it's the board, maybe it's senior management, and, and we're all sitting around the table, and instead of the fundraising data or the audience data going up and to the right, you know, we always want it up and to the right, it's just kind of going like this, <laughs> or maybe like this, and then this happens. You know, what if we don't change at all and something magical happens? <laughs> okay, so this is what I'm talking about. So let me tell you two stories about how to be, how nonprofits are data informed, okay? The first one is an organization called dosomething.org. Uh, how many have heard of them? They're great, great organization to learn from. So um, they, wanna ha they have a goal of having uh, 15 million teens active on social change causes online by 2020. Um, and their CEO, Nancy Loveland, she's actually moved over to a project they manage called the Crisis Text Line. But when she uh, assumed the position, which she calls chief old person, because um, <laughs> everyone on staff is pretty young, um, her board chair, who is Rem Hoffman, the CEO of um, LinkedIn, and DJ Patel, who is their data scientist, said, Nancy, lose your gut. Oh, is he saying, call me fat? I know, you know. What they meant was, as the CEO, you have to make decisions and ask, what does the data say? You have to be data informed. Don't make decisions based on your opinion of one. And so they didn't just say that, but they gave her guidance. You need data scientists on staff. This is a fairly small organization, but she went out and she hired Bob and Jeffrey, two uh, biology PhDs who were great statisticians, great data nerds. And so I, I did some fly on the wall research and I you know, just uh, observed in their office for a few hours. So they don't like sit in the corner and play with their spreadsheets. You know, they're not segregated or siloed. It's an open office space. And they work on these cross-disciplinary teams for campaigns, and they help staff figure out what data they need. They handle the technical stuff, but they make sure that there is time thinking about it. And I heard this great quote, we spend more time thinking about the data than collecting it. And, and then I said, well, how much time? 70% thinking about it, 30% collecting it, okay? So what happens a lot in organizations, we spend so much time collecting the data that we don't make sense of it. Okay, we're so exhausted, or we have such a fat spreadsheet, we don't know what to do with it. So here's a little story with a campaign that happened while I was in the office. They launched this Picks for Pets, and they'd done some research that animals were being killed in shelters because uh, the shelters weren't posting enough pictures of the cute animals online. So they wanted to do a campaign to recruit fur-tographers, young people who could download an app go into a, find a shelter, go in, take a picture, and, and spread it online, okay? So they launched the program on Good Morning America, and Kathy Lee, give her, dropped a puppy on its head. No, 
no puppies were harmed <laughs> in that segment, but of course, you know, everyone had their cell phone, mobile phone camera, and some folks got it, uh, hold of this clip, and they made it go fast, they did it backwards, and you know, and it, it didn't quite go viral, but enough um, influential bloggers wrote about it, and including Gawker, and in the first sentence, you see, during a Today Show segment about a hyperlink, do something.org app, Okay, so I was in the office and the data scientists were there and they excused themselves and they ran into this room, okay, and I'm like following them with my notebook and my camera and, um, and they're actually looking at the conversion rates in real time and they're coming up with hypotheses about how can we get more influencers to download the app, who are influencers here, what if we reconstruct the landing page, and, and so on. So they do real time decision making a real-time data collection, real-time decision-making, and it's this iterative um, process to get to really powerful results in all of their campaigns. So if you look at it, over time they have, they know what the conversion metrics are, and I, you know, I messed up. I should not have depicted this as a, um, a pyramid because it's not a linear process, as we know, with social. There's influencers. It's more like a sphere. My friend Allie Newworth, I think, talked about the customer journey. So she could tweet out her her, uh, her slides, right? <laughs> so, but, so there are all these like levels of conversion, but people are coming in at different levels, and they are coming in because they may be influenced from who they're connected with. And they, they do things like, um, you see the dog? They'll send out an email letter with that photo of the dog, and they'll do A-B testing of the dog looking straight at people, or the dog you know, off to the side. Which one is better? And then they go with the one that did better for the whole, um, whole campaign. They're pretty amazing in, in their discipline around using data and keeping it balanced between the technical and the human side. So, <clears throat> how many know who that guy is? <laughs> Not me, the guy, okay. <laughs> All right, um, so the Yoda, and do we know who the creator of Yoda is? George Lucas, Star Wars, okay. So that's the, um, that's the George Lucas Foundation, and they have a project called um, Edutopia. How many are familiar with Edutopia? Okay, it's a they, beautiful, I think if you want to look at examples of really excellent social media um, use, um, look at them. So I, I came in and I worked with them. Um, the CEO said, you know, we have a dashboard. You know, our results are really around um, trying to uh, curate and create robust content that's distributed through mobile, social, video, offline channels. We have a robust online community. We do an influencer cap campaign. And so we have different, you know, results that we're trying to get, you know, reach, engagement. Um, ultimately, we're trying to get to improve education. But you know what? Our dashboard, we're only measuring reach. Okay, and we know if it's only what you're measuring, that's the only thing that gets done. And of course, this is an organization with many people working on content, with many different opinions. There's also a board. There's also senior management, okay? So they know what the technical skill of knowing what those outcomes are is easy, but getting consensus on what they are is a whole other story, and then constructing a, a, a dashboard. So they actually went through a series of design labs to design their dashboard on the wall. Everybody contributed what they thought were the most important metrics um, to measure impact. And what, you know, what did the board think? What did um, the senior management think? What did the mobile team think um, along each of those outcomes? And so this allowed them then to design a dashboard with multiple views that would be helpful for decision making and also to show impact. Now, what came out of this was a reflection from the staff saying, you know what? We're a bunch of perfectionists, and so we're so focused on just impact that we're not iterating and experimenting at all because we want to make it perfect. So what happened after that was this whole, they embraced this notion of satisficing, and that's not goofing off, and it's not pure, you know, crap work. It's, it's, it's Ira Glass's closing the gap, doing it enough times. So they set up an organizational process where they set up experiments, little bets, if you will, um, related to those outcome measurements, and then they reflected on what worked, what didn't work, and they iterated again. 
things, you know, from can we get, you know, um, can we get more engagement on our YouTube channel if we crowdsource the topics from our following, you know? So they had their metrics, they set up, up as an experiment, and they, you know, th then they were able to iterate and uh, draw that into strategy. They also got into things like, what if instead of having a three-hour staff meeting to plan the content for the whole month, what if we broke this up during the month into, you know, three half-hour meetings? Oh, um, uh, per month, will we still be as effective? You know, and, and yes, they were, and they found additional time. So they were trying to teach themselves to be agile, um, really important. So I'm gonna close with one final really important skill related to this, and um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about the F word. Not that F word, okay? I'm gonna talk about failure and data because not the data doesn't always come back showing that you're successful, right? Oh, of course, everyone here, all, all my data shows that I'm successful, right? Never have a bad grade, right? Okay, so, and what happens when something, you know, you're, you know, you have some data that comes back and it's showing something's not working, what happens? We point the finger, not that finger, that finger, okay? And it starts the Fickle finger of failure, okay? Let's see how this plays out in organizations. Okay, so that guy, he's saying, it's all your fault, okay? It's all your fault. That's the director, and he's saying that to his staff. And the other guy's saying, nah, 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 it's the agency's fault, okay? And that guy in the middle there, see that guy in the blue shirt in the middle? Uh, oh, no, scratching his head. He's like, what failure? <laughs> you know, he's denying it. And then that guy over there in the corner, like this, you see him? You see him? You see him? Okay, what's going on inside his head? What's going on there? Well, let's just go take a look. It was all my fault. How could I have been so stupid? I've screwed up again. Why do you keep me around here? Forgive me, forgive me, please. What a dumb thing to do. Fire me where I stand. I destroy everything I touch with my incompetence. I'm a disease. I make myself sick. Okay, so uh, the point is we blame ourselves, right? We blame ourselves. So according to research, this is the Saul Rosenzweig theory, there's three dysfunctional reactions to failure, okay? We blame others, we deny the blame, okay? We don't think it's a problem, or we blame ourselves, okay? And that sets up, um, we had a great discussion yesterday in uh, the Art Brain Trust, talking about having some kindness and forgiveness to other people and staff. That sets up, you know, some dysfunctions and not, you know, always a great way to work, okay? So I think the key is, if you can understand in yourself what your particular dysfunctional <laughs> reaction is to failure, then you can then work, un understand that on your team and begin to have a better organizational response. So I'm gonna lead you through an exercise, all right? Before, one final exercise on, on this, and some of you may be familiar with this because it comes from theater exercises from a guy named Matt Smith. So he does this thing called the failure bell, okay? So just, just you know, think for a moment, you know, think back to either work or think back to school when you failed something or something didn't go right, okay? Think about it for a moment. Okay, you know, you're feeling that, you're kind of, kind of crunching over like a Gumby and you kind of feel that, 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 that chain, right? Right, that, that's a bad thing to, 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 to carry, okay? And so what gymnasts do, okay, if they were worried about failing when they were on the high wire, they could fall <laughs> and they could kill themselves. So what they do when they make a mistake, they land and they do the failure bell. They land, the hands go up. You might see it in the Olympics, you know? Raise your hands, okay? So Matt has this failure bell, okay? You raise your hands in the air, you bow, you grin like a submissive dog. You say, thank you, I failed, and you move on and learn. Now you can't do this if you're late for a meeting to run in and go, I failed! <laughs> 
you know, or maybe you can do it under the table, you know, but, you know, it, it, it's just a good exercise to do. So I'm going to have everybody do it with me, all right? I want you to stand up. <clears throat> Raise your hands in the air, <laughs> okay, and, say, uh, and bow, right? Grin like a submissive dog and say, thank you, I failed. Thank you, I failed. Now I can move on and learn. Now I can move on and learn. Okay, let's give yourselves a hand. <laughs> okay. So if you can look at failure and mistakes as your friend because they're your teachers and you can learn and you can get better, your organization can get better, then you can make a, have an organizational approach to doing this. And this is just one from Moms Rising. They have joyful funerals. They have a Monday metrics meeting every Monday morning for a half hour. They go over their campaigns, and if something, you know, didn't work well, they, um, you know, they say, should we? Okay, should we start in a eulogy? Should we start burying this technique? You know, what happened, and uh, why did it go wrong? Um, what can we do differently next time? And this has led them to their most successful campaigns. Um, their most successful campaign was a Mother's Day uh, video campaign to get people to uh, pay attention to a policy about work leave. But it, they launched it on Mother's Day, and you could actually have a fa pick a famous person wishing your mother or, um, um, happy Mother's Day. And so it would have a uh, customized message. And they had tried this kind of video action before, and it was a complete bomb, okay? And they got like six people to do it. And so, um, and from that, they interviewed people and they found out, oh, the, uh, their parents, they don't have time to do this. So then they set up this campaign where um, it was easy for people to just click some buttons and customize a video message and send it. And what happened, they had a million people sending the message and they were, a, and they fought, and 250,000 who clicked through and signed up for membership, 25%. And this all came from a failure that didn't work and um, understanding how they can make it better, having an organizational process. So I'm going to leave you with three things before we open it up for Q&A. Um, you know, empower all that board and staff to leverage their personal brands and networks in service of your art. And um, that's going to be great power. Um, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, there are some things that go along with that. Balance the technical and human data skills. Go beyond just counting and learn from it. Make changes to improve your art, brand, or strategy. And don't be afraid to take risks and fail as long as you learn from it. So I'll leave that here. <laughs> yeah. And open it up for questions. Okay. Um, my question is that your, your, your point about um, sort of enabling board and staff to use their own personal sort of networks. And for those of us who are a little concerned about kind of this idea of brand and like uh, keeping that authentic or keeping that voice consistent, and if, you, um, if you're actually kind of spreading that out or decentralizing, I f it, can you just speak to that sort of that sweet spot or that risk of maybe losing that authenticity. Okay, so th this gets back to the whole idea of working in a networked approach versus a broadcast approach. So, you know, top-down control, we're gonna control our brand and we're only gonna have the brand's network. And so the shift is, you know, as Clay Shirky identified, you know, you have to start sharing control. And that starts internally as well as externally. So, so what the organizations that do this successfully is they do have a, a brand strategy. And, and they use that as a basis for people to construct their, their personal voice that aligns with it, okay? So, and, and there are guidelines. There are personal social media use guidelines. There's training, um, and there's a lot of um, um, support to do it. So it's not like staff is just running off randomly doing things. You know, they have talking points. They have examples. Um, they have a point person, usually the marketing person, who's um, managing this. Did I just? 
Oh, that's me. I'm sorry, I'm seeing something different here on the screen. Uh, <laughs> and it was, it was, uh, it d distracted me for a moment. So, and uh, m managing these evangelists, okay? So, you know, a lot of us think of trying to get evangelists from external sources, but why not these people inside of our organization who love what we do and know about us and can be educated around what our branding strategy is, why can't we leverage them? And they probably have networks of people who are already predisposed to be, you know, like our organizations or want to come, you know, experience them. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I, I could also tweet out, I have a whole set of links and, and materials that, um, you know, the steps that you need to do to build an effective group of um, insider um, evangelists. Okay, everyone's tired, right? <laughs> okay. So, what was your uh, favorite part about writing this latest book? Okay, can you? Well, sorry. Uh, what I, was your favorite part about writing uh, the latest book that you just wrote? Because I read your first one and about halfway done through your second Okay, so measuring the network nonprofit? <laughs> the favorite part of writing it, okay. Well, being data nerd, I wasn't a data nerd when I started it. Um, and, and the first line in the book, um, Beth, if I can remember it, it's something like, Beth was always a afraid of measurement because she flunked algebra in high school and the thought of um, touching a spreadsheet was, she ran from it like having Darth Vader chasing after her with a radioactive cleaver. That was the start of it and the way, and the reason I got started with this book was I did at South by Southwest, I did a panel called the Social Media Measurement Poetry Slam and I had, um, the Red Cross, the National Wildlife Federation, um, present their uh, data stories in verse. Um, <laughs> yeah, they love that, but they did it. And then I asked Katie Payne, who was the preeminent social media expert guru, to be the judge and to give them feedback. And Katie, um, uh, uh, <laughs> Katie actually responded in rhyme as well. So, so, and it was such a great experience working with them, and then I kind of lost my fear of measurement, and then I started hearing how people needed that, and so I suggested to Katie we should collaborate on a book, and she said yes. <laughs> and so then we had to set up this writing process, and because we had different writing styles, we had a developmental editor work with us, so we had, and we had uh, 12 chapters, and they went through three sets of iterations, so I got to do the first shitty draft, you know, I did the first shitty draft, it went to Katie, and then it went to Bill, our um, developmental editor, and then it came back to me, we iterated again, and then we did a third iteration, and then, so that was nine points, and then 10 was perfection, and we said we'll never get to 10. Then we had this dashboard <laughs> up. If you can imagine a spreadsheet that's color-coded, and you have chapter one, two, three, four, and then you have the 10 stages, and so if we finished a stage, it was green, um, if it was almost finished, it was yellow, and if it wasn't yet started, <laughs> it was red. So I could pop up, you know, during the six months, I could look at this dashboard and say, oh shit, I gotta get going, where are deadlines coming, you know? It was really motivating. <laughs> so that was my favorite part. We had this kind of measurement piece that guided the writing. Uh, where where you draw that line between organic and paid? Um, does one feed the other? Do they just go hand in hand, or do you hopefully get away from paid if you do organic well enough? Uh, okay, so um, so one thing that you should know is that um, Facebook is finally giving away some ad credits, and you can you can go to my Facebook brand page and you can find the link from Action Sprout. Finally, after six years, they we've got the door cracked open, and they're giving away up to two million dollars of um, ad credits through Action Sprout. Um, and so, okay, so from, and Action Sprout's collected a lot of data on this, and that the thing is that um, if you are boosting and promoting content that sucks or that your audience doesn't want, it's, it's wasting your money. So you really have to have a measurement process in place to understand what content really resonates and what gets engagement. And it isn't always the content that you want, that you want out there, okay? So if you know what your secret sauce is for getting good organic engagement, then those are the, the posts and the content that you should boost. And I would read John Loomer, 
I don't know if you, anyone knows him. He's, um, I, I'd say he's one of the better ones writing about Facebook ads and John Hyden, who writes about it from a nonprofit lens. Um, and it's going to requ it requires a lot of A-B testing. You know, so you have to tweak the photos you use or the headlines, where you're sending people. And you can't just like set it and forget it. Um, so you have to dedicate yourself to have an, a, a testing and iteration mindset. If you are working in an organization that currently is not embracing that creativity and the cross-departmental support, how can you, do you have pointers on how to really start to infiltrate that and be that example? Oh God. Push them forward. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Okay. It's really hard because a lot of it reflects leadership, you know, um, so, but, up. <laughs> well, one thing, um, for example, the Humane Society, I mean, it's a larger organization. With, they tended to be in silos by they had the mobile team, the social team, the email team, the Google Analytics team. And um, the social media manager, Carrie Lewis, was really instrumental in saying, hey, we're not talking to each other, and this is like really bad because we're each touching a different part of the elephant. We're not getting a holistic picture. Of, uh, of what to do and then so we should have this meeting where by campaign structure and and share updates of what we're learning and everyone's going no we don't have time and and so she said what if we just did it as a 15 minute standing meeting okay and and and, and we just looked at some results and we had our interns sort of copy down uh, the discussion and we archived it in a way for when we're planning the next uh, campaign. So one story is that, and this is uh, sort of unbelievable because they're a big organization. So they're at this meeting and she had a fundraising campaign and they weren't able to put Google tracking com uh, conversion trackers on it. So they don't know who was converting from Facebook or, or whatever. And, and so they, they weren't getting all the information they needed to figure out whether the campaign was successful. And so, um, and so she asked, so she invited the Google Analytics person to the meeting, which is a good thing, and said, why don't we get some Google tracking codes on these campaigns? And they have so many campaigns, they said, oh, I can't do them all. So, well, let's try one, okay? Um, so, um, so they did one, and they got this great information to help them do really better on the next one. And they, they gave a lot of kudos to the, to the guy, who the, the Google Analytics guy. And then they started this thing in the office called um, the source, source code jar, OK? Haven't you heard of swearing jars? You know, if you're a parent and you drop an F-bomb, you put a quarter in, you know. So this was a source code jar. Every time they didn't put a source code, they had to drop a quarter into the jar, and they would get enough money to go out for a beer. But Carrie's proud to say that they never filled the jar because they got so excited by the fact that this simple tweak could get them some more information and start talking to each other. And now that they have standardized these 15-minute um, of standing meetings, literally standing, giving an update, having an intern or somebody capture the discussion. They have a series of Google Docs, so when they, they go back to that when they're planning a campaign. What happened last year? What worked? What didn't they have it? <laughs> Let's see how many steps, like, I got uh, 3,000 steps during the keynote. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> Okay, so can I put up uh, my second to last slide? Is it possible? So, okay. The one, yeah, the next, that second to last slide. That one, yes. Okay, so some of you already know this because we're talking about this, and I'm kind of on to the next thing, and it's kind of a logical progression from networks, data. Um, I'm on to looking at um, self-care in the nonprofit sector. Um, you know, how do we do that individually, and how do we do that scaling within organizations and communities? So I just also wanted to invite you, if you want to be part of the book, um, if you have some tips, if you have a story, you know, screen capture, take a picture with your uh, mobile phone, that URL, be in touch. Um, you can flip to the next slide, or I can actually, right? Yes. Yes. So if you need to, you know, follow me, ask questions. I love hearing from folks. You're, you guys are awesome, and thank you so much. Yeah.
Oh, is there a script up here? Is there a script up here? No? Okay. Uh, all right. So I don't have a script up here, but uh, thank you everyone for joining us here in Salt Lake City for the 2015 National Arts Marketing Project. Um, I just want to uh, first of all thank you, Beth, for closing out with such a fantastic keynote. It was wonderful. I also want to thank our, again, our sponsors, our wonderful local co-host, Karen, led by Karen Krieger. We've been planning this event for over two years, and it's been a wonderful partnership. We will miss you, and I hope our work continues. Cross paths again sometime soon. Um, I also want to thank the amazing staff at Americans for the Arts. It really does take a village to put this event together, and I couldn't have done it without all of you. Um, uh, just a few other people, our amazing AV crew who is on site with us every year. Um, uh, and the NAMP Advisory Committee who plays a huge role in helping to curate sessions, keynotes like Beth, Jad, and Donna, um, and session selection content. Um, it, they are wonderful. Stand up, please. Anyone who's here from the NAMP Advisory Committee, give yourselves a big round of applause. Um, so again, uh, thank you to all our sponsors. Uh, everyone have a safe trip home. Um, if you're here to explore Salt Lake for a few days, there's a lot of wonderful things to see. So uh, thank you, we'll see you in Austin. Thank you.